All right, how are you guys doing? Good, good, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I came here really for three reasons. One is I love Jesus. Uh, oh, that's good. I was kind of hoping some of y'all did too. Uh, two, I love you guys, I love this university. I'm glad that you do too. And the third reason I came here is because of that snow hill y'all have got over there. I love that thing. And last time I was here, I didn't even know about it. And they're like, you want to go over there and see it? I was like, yeah, I want to see it. I'm going to go down that thing. And so I can't wait to sneak over there again this afternoon and uh, go down it. I just love that thing. I think it's a blast. All right. Hey, if you have a Bible, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Um, as Johnny just mentioned, I just wrote this book called Let Hope In, and it's about four ch- ch- choices we all make that can really change our life forever. And the book's all about just hope. And so I've been running around the country talking about this idea of hope. Um, and today, I, I really, I want to talk to you about the idea of hope. I just want to do it in kind of a different way. And this for me isn't, it's not a conference talk that I give. This is just a word that I feel like God's put on my heart that is really just very practical. In the book, one of the things I talk about is this idea of the choice to free people. And my whole life I've heard this phrase that hurt people hurt people. And that's true. Like, I mean, you've experienced that in your life. Hurt people do hurt people. What is equally true though, on the flip side of that, is that free people free people. And I think as followers of Christ, we have the ultimate freedom, right? Because you have freedom from the consequences of your sin through Jesus Christ. You have freedom from having to go through your life wondering whether or not you have purpose, right? You have freedom to forgive other people for the things that they've done to you because you yourself have been forgiven. And so we have this unbelievable freedom that I believe we need to extend to others. Free people, free people. Now, one of the ways that I think that we can do that is through our words that we speak. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about just the power of your words. And I'm going to tell you three things that I think I know about every single one of you, okay? Let's test this out. The first thing I think I know about every single one of you is that you use words. You use words. You talk. And oh my goodness, like do some of you talk? Some of you talk a lot. Some of you have a hard time stop talking, right? But we all use words. Studies show if you're a guy, if you're a guy here, let me hear from you. All right. That was so manly. Um, guys, uh, studies show on average you use 7,000 words a day, all right, 7,000. If you're a lady, let me hear from you. That's about right. You use, don't get mad at me, I'm just, I'm just the bearer of the research. You use 20,000 words a day. <laughs> That means, that means you are lean, mean, communicating machines, all right? You got a lot of words. Now, let me tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little projection. For those of you who aren't married, and one day, more than likely, you will be married, this is going to create some issues. Because when I get home from the day, my wife asks me, how was your day? I respond by saying, it was good. And then I turn around and I ask her, how was your day? And I'm about to get hit by 13,000 words in a moment, all right? It's just interesting. But listen, whether you're a guy, whether you're a girl, it doesn't matter. You use words. Let me give you a verse, Proverbs 18, 21. It says this, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That's powerful, isn't it? The tongue has the power of life and death. You use words. You talk. Every relationship, every circumstance is dyed with words, and you're either breathing life or you're breathing death into every relationship you have, because words give life 
and words bring death. You choose which one. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means, first of all, that you have never spoken a neutral word in your life. Your words have direction to them. And either your words are moving in the direction of life, which means that they are words of encouragement, and they are words of hope, and they are words of peace, and they are words of instruction, and they are words of wisdom, and they are words of correction, or your words are moving in the opposite direction, which means that they are moving towards death, which means that they are words of anger, and malice, and violence, and judgment, and condemnation, and racism. Your words breathe life, or they bring death. You use words. That's the first thing I know about every one of you. Here's the second thing I know about you is that your deepest pain and your greatest joy have been accompanied by words. I don't know who it was that said like, talk is cheap, but they were a liar. Because words are powerful, painful, awful, and also amazing tools. They can hurt, they can help, they can hinder, they can heal, but they are not cheap. In fact, your words are quite expensive. Every word will cost you something. Words have a price tag. That's why with words, wars have been started, murders have been initiated, divorces have been sealed, children's self-esteem has been shattered. Words can end friendships, splinter families, shatter reputations, split churches. And I know that in my own life, the, the saddest and also the most celebratory moments of my life have been accompanied by words. You know that every time I stand up to speak, anywhere that I speak, every time that I sit down to write a book, it's like there's this, this company of a hundred people who are behind me, who have spoken into my life everything that I know, everything that I speak, everything that I think about the person of God. There's a group of people who have spoken into my life some of the most glorious, joyful truths that have impacted me and transformed my life. And I will be forever grateful to those people. But the flip side of that is as a pastor, I regularly meet with people who are 22, 32, 42, 52, 62 years old, who will talk to me about some of the horrible things that their parents said to them. And when they talk about those words from yesteryear, they will cry as if it happened yesterday. Now, why is that? Well, because there is a scary, painful, long-term shelf life to ugly, hateful, abusive talk. And some of you in this room know that all too well. Because you remember the day that that group of kids at school called you fat. And some of you never let go of those words. And for some of you, it's impacted you in some unbelievably healthy ways. Maybe it's an eating disorder. Maybe you spent your whole life with your self-esteem shattered, and so you've looked for love in all the wrong places. And it all started with that hateful, abusive talk. Some of you never forget the day that that teacher told you that you were lazy. Some of you never forget the day that your dad called you stupid. And it's impacted you in unbelievable ways. There is a scary, painful, long-term shelf life to ugly, hateful, abusive talk. So the two things I know about you so far is you use words, right? Every one of you use words. The, the deepest pain and the most glorious celebration of your life has been accompanied by words. And the third thing that I know about you is that your world of words is a world of trouble. And I know this for sure, not because I really know you, but because I know me. Just think about this. Anybody here comfortable? um, If we were to replay publicly in this room right now, every conversation, every word that you have spoken in the past week, anybody want to sign up for that experiment? Like not even for some free donuts, right? I mean, like you're you're not going to do that. We all 
have these conversations that we wish we could snatch out of history. We do anything to go back and, and, and keep that other person from hearing those words from us. And listen, I'm not proud of everything I've said. I, I wish I could tell you I'm proud of everything I've said to my wife. I wish I could tell you that I'm proud of everything that I, I've, I've said to my kids before, but I'm not. And, and let me tell you, you guys live in a very tricky time with a lot of tricky technology, which complicates this even more. You ever sent an email before that you wish you could get back? Anybody? I want to I wanna design like some software where um, like there's this button, okay, where you send an email, but it doesn't go out right away. And so in five minutes, they contact you and they're like, hey, do you really want to send that email? And if you say yes, then like in 20 minutes, they contact you back and they're like, are you sure? Because like we've all sent that email and then like as soon as you send it, you're like, no, like you want it back, but you can't take it back. And I just want to encourage you guys, um, there is something about the anonymity of email and Twitter and text messaging that leads people to a level of sarcasm and hostility that they would never engage in if they were looking at somebody face to face. And I just want to remind you, every time you send that tweet about somebody, that is a real person on the other end of that tweet, All right? That's a real person there. Every time you shoot that email off, that's a little bit sarcastic, a little bit hateful. Listen, my experience is people are unbelievably brave when they are sitting behind a computer. People are unbelievably brave and bold when they're behind their phone getting ready to send a tweet. These are real people that are impacted by your real words. And so the more sensitive the subject, I just want to encourage you, take the time. It's so easy to fire off a tweet. It's so easy to shoot off that email, but take the time. And here's why this is important. Let me read to you some words from Jesus, Matthew chapter 12. He says this, good trees produce good fruits. Bad trees produce bad fruits. Well, thank you, Jesus. That, that explains a lot right there, right? You can always tell a tree by its fruits. You children of snakes, you who are evil, how could you possibly say anything good? Now, listen to this. This is all a setup, all right, for Jesus to say these very powerful words in Matthew 12. He says this, for the mouth simply shapes the heart's impulses into words. Let me say that again. The mouth simply shapes the heart's impulses into words. He goes on to say, and so the good man who's filled with goodness speaks good words, while the evil man who's filled with evil speaks evil words. So what Jesus is saying, hey, for those of you who think that you have a mouth problem, he says, I hate to tell you this, but it's actually much worse. You don't have a mouth problem, which you have is a heart problem. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and you're just kind of talking and then you say something like kind of hateful and then you follow it up by like, oh, I don't know where that came from. Ooh, I do. I do, pick me. It came from your heart, right? And so what happens a lot of times is we'll say, oh, I got to work on my mouth. I got a mouth problem. I got to be real careful about the words that I use. And so we'll set out with all of this willpower to work on our mouth. The problem is it's a heart problem. So whatever is going on in your heart eventually is going to come out of your mouth. And so you got to focus, and this is what Jesus was always about. He always brought it back to this, about heart transformation. Now, some of you will say, well, okay, I'm just going to avoid this whole mess. Like, if my words can do that much damage to people, I'll just stop talking, right? Or I'll just talk less. The problem with that is this. I believe God's goal is so much bigger than the students at Liberty just learning how to not say mean things. God's goal usually is not for us to just avoid sin. And I think this is a very important principle for us to kind of understand as students who are kind of seeking to be transformed by Christ and live the life that he's designed for us to live. God's goal for the human race 
is not just that we avoid sin. You understand that, right? The Christian life is so much more than you just avoiding sin. In other words, there could be no sin happening here on the campus at Liberty. And that would not necessarily bring great delight to God's heart. Because God's goal for liberty is not just the avoidance of sin. God's goal for this campus is that there would be an explosion of goodness and joy and love. That's God's goal. And if you never talked, there would never be any expression of life. If you never talked, this world would never know about the creative ideas that God has given you. There would never be the articulation of hope. So God's goal is so much greater than just avoiding sin. This is not about avoiding verbal sin. See, I believe that as damaging as your words can be, they're equally as life-giving. Your words have the ability to heal people. There is a power in our words, and that's not by accident. Okay, when you look back over your past and you think about how certain words, certain conversations have impacted you, you understand that wasn't by accident, right? God has designed the human soul in such a way that our words have tremendous power. And so words that come out of other people's mouth impact and shape your soul. Words that come out of your mouth will impact and shape the soul of the people around us. God has designed the human soul where words are either gonna build up or they're gonna tear down. That's why Ephesians 4 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Proverbs 15, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And we've all felt that, right? Because our world, our words, has a way of beating people up. Life has a way of beating people up. And so as you go through your life and as you go through your years here at Liberty, what you're going to encounter is all kinds of people who are lying on the side of the road because life has crushed them. But God has given you the ability to speak words into their life that could help heal their spirit. Because I'm gonna tell you a little secret about every single person in your life. All right, this is a secret about every single person that God allows you to lock eyes with. This is true about your boyfriend. This is true about your girlfriend. This is true about your parents. This is true about your roommate. This is true about every single person that's sitting on your row right now. No matter how well put together they may appear, everyone needs healing. Everyone. Nobody goes through this life without being hurt and broken and bruised. And what we've learned in our world and what we've learned in our society, and unfortunately sometimes the patterns that we've picked up in our churches is that we need to hide. And so people ask us, how are you doing? And we say, I'm fine. And you say that over and over and over, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, until you actually start to believe that you're fine, but you're not. You are hurt, you are lonely, you are confused because you live in a broken world where words in many times have hurt you and destroyed you. And what I really want you to grasp, this is my one goal for today, is that when you walk out of here in just a minute, that you will grasp the power of your words, that you will never be tempted to think again that your words don't matter because your words do matter and they have life in them and people can find out that God loves them with your words. People can find out that they have worth with your words. People can find out that they have value with your words. People can find out that they have purpose with your words. The tongue has the power of life and death. So here's two questions. All right, if you're taking notes, I want you guys to write these two questions down. You can think about that this week. The first question is this, who has God placed in your life? Pretty simple, right? Who has God placed in your life? And maybe, maybe what you do this week, maybe what you do this afternoon is you just list the top five relationships in your life. 
Five most important relationships in your life. Answer the first question, who has God put in your life? And then the second question I want you to ask is what do they need to hear you say? Who has God put in your life? What do they need to hear you say? Guys, when's the last time you sat down with your girlfriend or sat down with your wife if you're married and just told them that they were an unbelievable gift from God to you? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, like I, she knows that, man. She knows she's a gift from God. Like, she doesn't need me to say that. I, I, listen, listen. It, it, it's not about what they know. It's about the scriptural principle that there's an unbelievable power to your words. And when those words come out of your mouth and they land on her soul, they shape her. Ladies, when's the last time you sat down with your boyfriend or you sat down with your husband and you just said to him, hey, I just want you to know that I really believe in you. And again, you'll be like, well, like they know that I believe in them. Like they're good at everything they do and everything they touch is just successful and they're just great and they give awesome grades and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. This, this isn't about what they know. This is about that there are power to our words. Hey, when's the last time that you called your parents and you told them what they mean to you? When's the last time you just picked up the phone and called them and said, hey, I just wanna thank you for all the years you've invested in my life and chasing me from sporting event to sporting event, sacrificing financially so I could go to an unbelievable Christian university. I just wanna thank you for you know, what you've done. And listen, hey, come on. I know your parents aren't perfect. I get that. I understand that. But there are power in your words. If you're a parent, I know there's some parents here. When's the last time you sat down with your kids and you just told them that you're proud of them? Listen, I am... I'm 39. I actually, the whole year I have thought that I was 38. And the other day I talked to my wife about being 38. She was like, you're not 38. This is like two weeks ago. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm 38. She's like, no, you are 39. And so two weeks ago, I lost a whole year of my life. <laughs> like how, how does that happen, right? So, okay, I'm 39. I'm, I'm still not sure about that. I could be 38, okay? I'm 38 or 39. And to this day, like when I speak at our church, my, my, my parents go to the church that I pastor. And there are a lot of people who after church will come up to you and say, hey, you did a great job. Thank, you know, great job. Thanks, proud of you, whatever. But listen, when my dad walks up to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he looks me in the eyes and he says, son, I'm proud of you. It melts me. There's a lot of people in my life who express their love to me, but when my mama walks up to me and she gives me a hug on Sunday and she says, I love you, it just does something to me. Hey, how about your roommate? When's the last time you just told them how much you appreciated them? <laughs> For picking up their stuff, hmm. right? Who are, you guys are so practical, you just go right to it, don't you? Who are the people in your life that need to hear something, right? Who are the people in your life? So let's go back to the two questions. What's question number one? Who has God put in your life? Question number two, what do they need to hear from you? What do they need to hear from you? Liberty, my prayer for you guys is that as you take this message to heart, as you take God's word to heart, that you will walk out of here and that there will be an explosion of goodness and love and compassion in this world. And I'm gonna ask you guys, if you would just bow your heads and I'm gonna put this, this, this message into practice with you. Can I do that? 
And I'm going to speak some words over you right now. And I felt like this morning God gave me some words to say to somebody here. And I don't have a clue which one of you needs to hear this. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to speak these words over you. And if this is for you, I hope, first of all, you'll be reminded that God loves you so much and he cares so much for you and he has such an amazing plan in your life that he brought me all the way from Nashville just to remind you of some simple truths. And here they are. You are a child of God. You are loved with the senseless, seamless, scandalous love of God. You never have to live in fear that you're not worthy of his love. You know, sometimes shame will blind us to the miracle of forgiveness. But if you're a Christian, the only shame that you carry right now is the shame that you choose to carry. You are one of the lights of the world. You were made to shine bright. So shine. God, you have created every one of us in such a way where our souls are impacted, either built up or destroyed by the power of words. And I know that there's some people right now in this auditorium, God, who have been destroyed by hateful, abusive talk. It's maybe led them to some very unhealthy, sinful patterns in their life. And God, I pray that in this very moment that you would steal those words for them, from them and replace them with truth. That you would remind them that they are one of your children, that they are loved beyond imagination. God, I pray that today you would remind us of this simple truth. Our words matter. They really matter. They carry more weight than we could ever imagine or believe. And God, your goal for us is so much more than just avoiding sin. Your goal, I believe, for this campus is for them to first impact this community in which they live, impact the state in which they live, but eventually for them to impact the world. And as they go and as they serve locally and as they serve regionally and as they serve globally, God, I pray that you will remind them that as they go, you have given them an unbelievable power, a power to heal the spirit. And that power comes through their words. God, I pray that every day as they walk across this campus, as they interact with their friends, as they interact with people in their class, as they pass somebody maybe they don't even know, that they will be reminded that everyone is hurting. Everyone needs healing. And their words can help bring the healing, God, that you so desire to bring to every person. God, please convict us. Who are the people in our life that need to hear something from us? And God, I pray we will waste no time, but we will get right to it today. For it's in your holy and your precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you all. Have a great day. Thanks, John.